<laughs> and let me tell you, Southern hospitality has had nothing on British hospitality. <laughs> uh, you guys have all just been wonderful. It's been a delight to finally make it uh, over to England. And uh, Frank told me when we both got the invitation, he said, the Brits will treat you well. <laughs> Indeed they have. So, uh, it's a real privilege to be able to be here and uh, share a story that's deeply important to me. Uh, I want to give a special shout out and, and thanks to Frank. Um, I've been privileged to be under his mentorship for almost two and a half decades, which makes us both older than either of us would like to admit. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, I've had the chance to listen to him tell stories about the battlefields that we both live among for a long time, and I still hear something new and thoughtful every time I listen to him. So, Frank, I just had a privilege to come on. And let, like, he's practically my next door neighbor. And I've just gone halfway across the world to get to hear me again. Um, so, thank you, Frank. Um, I'm with a group of historians called Emerging Civil War. There are right now 35 of us that contribute to a blog every day, uh, www.emergingcivilwar.com. It's free content, different writers with different backgrounds, different writing styles, different interests, all contributing to this blog as what I think is a wonderful conversation among historians. And we'd love to have you follow along with us. So you can log in and read the work of emerging voices in the field. Some of us are a little more emerged than others at this point. Um, but uh, you know, it's really an opportunity for me as a public historian, the opportunity to interact with people and talk with them and bounce ideas off them and hear their ideas and learn. Um, that, I think, is really the great way to engage with history because we then are engaged. It's a living thing. It's not some old, dusty, bunch of facts. Um, so we'd love to have you kind of follow along with us. We do have a newsletter. Um, I've left the sign-up sheet right in front of Darren if you want to stop by and put your email address on there. We don't give, our e uh, give your email addresses out to anybody. It's just a way for us as a community to stay in touch with our readers and let you know what projects we have coming up and who's speaking where and what books we have coming up and those sorts of things. So uh, feel free to sign up. We'd love to, to have you come along. Um, you know, we really believe that uh, you know, if we don't stay in touch with our history, as the old saying goes, we're doomed to repeat its mistakes, and we fail to learn from the wisdom that it has to offer us. And so I think that's why that engagement with history is so important. Well, how many of you have been to Spotsylvania before? I know many of you have been. And, you know, I don't have a PowerPoint because pictures aren't going to do it justice. Um, Spots is just a beautiful, pristine battlefield. If you go there today, you're going to see what the soldiers saw when they first showed up on the 8th of May, 1864. It's like a time capsule, and we get to stand in the footsteps and see what those soldiers saw. The two lines are accurate. Um, it's not cluttered with a lot of signs and monuments and tourists. You can really touch history. And when we think about today, um, the story about what happened there, um, and it's such to me it's such a, a sublime connection with the horrific story. You know, when Frank was talking earlier about the bloodiest battles of the Civil War, and we talked about wilderness being the fifth, Spotsy supersedes that. <laughs> But think about them as back to back. Mm -hmm. And when we think about those not as two separate actions, but we're going to start fighting in the wilderness and go for six straight weeks. Before then, we settle into the nine month siege of Petersburg. It is unprecedented. And I'm sure that some of you have heard that Gettysburg is the turning point of the war. I know many of you have been there. How many of you have heard that? Gettysburg is the turning point of the war. And I'm here to tell you that it's Balderdash. <laughs> <laughs> Nonsense. When Frank talked about that consequential decision that Grant makes in the wilderness, that's the turning point of the war, that and the Emancipation Proclamation. Because up to that point, the armies fight, they disengage, they catch their breaths, they reinforce, they re-equip, they resupply, and they go back at it again. And Grant says no. Because as part of this grand strategy that Frank talked about, you know, the election's coming up, Grant needs to knock Lee out of the fight. But if he can't, he says, if by no other means than attrition, we'll simply use them up. And Lincoln's looking for someone willing to do that grim arithmetic. And so, by making that decision in the wilderness to head down to Spotsy to continue on, we're going to keep doing that awful math. And we're just going to keep using up Robert Lee's army. So for the purpose of our discussion today, the wilderness is going to be back in the corner where you see the flag, the road that's going to head to spots. He's going to come right down the side of the room. Keith's sitting in a little place called 
Todd's Tavern, oh boy for you. I hate to do this to him, but Frank's right about the area where Phil Sheridan's men are. <laughs> and that road is going to kind of continue right out of here to the village of Spotsylvania Courthouse. There's a road that's going to go up this side of the road. It's going to head off to Fredericksburg, only 10 miles away. And when Grant makes that decision, he starts heading down to Spotsylvania. This is where he wanted to go because the ground opens up as you get past the wilderness. That 75 square mile dense deciduous jungle that Frank talked about. We can get there, open fields, we can deploy our men, use that artillery, maneuver our cavalry. We can use our advantages as a Union army. The one thing we have fewer of is men. Grant starts out with a slightly under 125,000 men. By the time he gets to spots, he's down to 100,000. So when we think about that attrition, I want you to come back to those numbers too. Lee's going to have about 55,000 by the time we get here down here. And as he starts making that move, he knows he needs this road, so he's going to send Sheridan's cavalry to clear it. And they get down to about where Frank gets, and ah, the Confederates are putting up some resistance, and so the <coughs> cavalry falls back to Todd's Tavern and encamps. And about midnight, Ulysses S. Grant and George Gordon Meade come down with the Federal Infantry Column, and they get to Todd's Tavern, and there are all these sleeping uh, cavalrymen. Like, where's Sheridan? Can't be found. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> so Meade's going to have to give direct orders to the cavalry, he up and starts kicking butts. We all know that Meade's got a very calm, cool temper. So, you know, he takes this in beautiful stride and says, Clean that road. And they get up and they start trying to, and they, they still can't. Sheridan finally shows up. He's been off galloping. He's like, What are you doing giving orders to my men? And he's like, Well, first of all, they're my men. But secondly, I'd give orders to you, except you weren't here. And they get to this big fight. It's the kind of thing that should get you fired. It's a terrible act of insubordination. And yet Meade can't do anything to Sheridan because Sheridan's Grant's money. When Grant came to the East, he brought Sheridan with him, put him in charge of the cavalry. And so the best that Meade can do is go to Grant like, your pal here, give me a hard time, you know, derelict in his duty, and he's like, just give me the cavalry, I'll go off and get James to it myself. Like, can you believe this guy? Grant says, well, Sheridan generally knows what he's talking about. Why don't you cut the orders and let him do it? And I'm a big fan of Grant. I admire him a great deal. But here is a failing on his part. Rather than backing your army commander, he backs his buddy. The bandy legged Irishman, as Shelby Foot calls him. The person <laughs> described Sheridan as being so low to the ground his knuckles nearly drag. <laughs> in our awful. In, in fact, our when, when Frank and I were talking about coming over, he's like, oh, good, we can say things about that psychopath together. <laughs> I was going to say, in our defense, he wasn't born in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We found the, uh, the integrity of Ireland. But I, really, I have to call him out at this moment because he does get the orders, and he will eventually take his cavalry down to Yellow Tavern. I don't want to spoil Frank's talk tomorrow, but um, you know he gets a pass because he's successful at Yellow Tavern. He gets Jeb Stewart, right? And so history's like, oh, look at that. The rest of the raid's a disaster. But worse, what your cavalry do for your army? Scout for it. Yeah. Okay, they're your eyes and ears as your scouts, right? So by taking away 13,000 cavalrymen, Sheridan's going to leave this army deaf and blind for the next three weeks. <laughs> you laugh, except that I am mf in the dude because it's going to cost thousands of Union lives mm -hmm. so that this guy can go showboat. And to me, that's no laughing matter because he is absolutely looking out for himself, and it's going to cost thousands of lives. Surely that's wrong. So yeah. 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 Well, and that's why I said, like, you back your buddy instead of your army commander, right? Probably and then you're going to ask your army commander to do things that, if I had cavalry, it'd be easier to do. Okay? It's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. So I got to call out Bill Sheridan because he's going to cause huge problems for this army, as we'll talk about today and tomorrow during the North Anna phase of this campaign. So, because the cavalry can't clear this road, Meade's going to have to use his infantry to do it. 
And so they start pushing forward, and they have two roads. There's one that kind of goes off in that direction, which we'll talk about in just a second, and one road that comes down here. And as the infantry tries to clear this road, the Confederate cavalry does a brilliant defense. Can I ask the two of you to help me out for just a moment? Stand up here for just a second. Okay, so what you get for sitting in the front row? Let's just hold Tommy up again. Yeah, all right. So Tommy, I want you to stand right here. In your first hand. Eric, if you could just stand here behind, all right? I want you to both face me in this direction. You are both have been um, constricting the better cavalry. So good for you. And I want you to think about each of these rows as like a ridge line along this road. And what the cavalry does is they split into two. And you're going to block the road, and you're going to block the road back there. And as I'm the infantry pushing forward, and I get to your barricades, I've got to deploy from my column march into my line of battle. And as I start to push forward, and I'm outflanking you, and you're kind of just delaying me. And as soon as I get close enough, you're going to hop on your horse, and you're going to ride behind him. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I should give him coconuts. <laughs> so now I've got to get back into my line of march, push forward. You've blocked the road. So now I've got to get back into my line of battle, push forward. And just as I get within rifle range, you're going to hop on your horses and you're going to ride behind John. <laughs> <laughs> so now I've got to get back into my line of march, push forward. And do it all over again. So it's like this accordion action as the Union infantry is trying to push through from ridge line to ridge line to ridge line down this road. You guys can't stop me, but you can slow me down. And that's all you have to do so that Lee's infantry can get into place. Let's give it up for our cavalry about <laughs> Robert E. Lee has been in the wilderness trying to figure out the tea leaves, trying to decide what uh, Grant's going to do. So he has his chief of artillery, Granny Pendleton, cut a road out of the wilderness because this is the road out of the wilderness and Grant has it. Grant talked to us about how important this road is. So Lee's got to create his own road. And he's going to have to march twice as far to try to get in front of Grant and block Grant's move. In order to do that, he needs this delaying action. The person who's going to lead that march is Richard Anderson, the new First Corps commander. He's taken over for James Longstreet. And I would argue that Longstreet's loss in this campaign is more significant than Jackson's loss was a year and three days earlier at Chancellorsville. And I say that as a Stonewall Jackson fanboy. Love the guy. <laughs> but Longstreet's one of two men in this army who knows anything about Ulysses S. Grant. He and Cadmus Wilcox, a division commander, had served with Long had served with Grant out west. Nobody else in this army has any idea who this Grant guy really is. <coughs> and if we think about one of Lee's superpowers, being able to sort of anticipate what his enemy is up to, he doesn't have that insight in this campaign, and we'll see over and over ways that he's going to misjudge Grant. Longstreet's the one guy who could have given him some insight. In fact, when he hears that, Long, that Grant's been named commander, Longstreet says, that man will fight us every single day until the end of the war. He will drive us back into that. So Longstreet's absence deprives the enemy of a vital insight. So Richard Anderson's going to take over. And Lee tells him on the evening of the 7th, I want you to leave the wilderness at 2 a.m. on the morning of the 8th and march to Spotsylvania on this brand new road that we've cut. But because of those forest fires that Frank mentioned earlier, one of them's kind of burning through the area where the First Corps is encamped. And so Anderson's going to get his men up and moving four hours early at 10 p.m. on the night of the 7th. And they're going to march around. And they finally get out of the area and they kind of camp down off this direction. And a courier shows up and says, We need you, we need you. The Yankees are coming down Brock Road. We've got to have your strength. Otherwise, they're going to get into Spotsylvania Corps. Now, it's important to realize Spotsylvania Courthouse itself is not important. The building, the courthouse building itself, not important. The village, not important. But it's got a road network. It would give Grant an inside track to Richmond. Richmond's not important. Up to this point in the war, it's been like off to Richmond, captured the Confederate capital. Okay? This is about destroying Lee's army. But by moving on Richmond, Grant knows that Lee's going to have to come out and defend it. And Grant's going to get that open field battle that he's looking for. So that's why this intersection 
becomes so important. And that's why the Confederates have to defend it. So Anderson's men, after just getting a break of about 30 and a half seconds, have to get back up and they double time the rest of the way. And they stop right about here, the last defensible ridge, before they get into town. And the federal infantry continue to push forward, doing that accordion action that we talked to. Finally, they get to this one ridge line and they push forward. But because of that accordion action, they're discombobulated. Unit cohesion has broken down. The men are exhausted. They're tired. They're frustrated. And so we're going to have a series of piecemeal attacks. And coming up on the left side of the road is going to be Peter Lyle's brigade. And as they push forward, the Confederates don't hop on their horses and ride away. That's when they finally discover they're up against the infantry. Jeb Stewart, the Confederate ca uh, cavalry commander who's still with the army at this point, rides up and he points to this spot in the intersection of the road and he tells Anderson's men, get up there if you don't run to that fence. Billy Yank's going to get there before you do. And Anderson's men run that point of contact at the moment of crisis just in time to repulse that first attack. Then we're going to have a second attack along the right side of the road about 15 minutes later. These piecemeal attacks unable to all go in at once. That gives Stuart the time to plug that gap. And these guys, Dennison's Marylanders, get in there. They're hand to hand fight and they are repulsed. There's going to be a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth attack across that field. Stuart able to plug them into the line at the right moment, at the right spot. The Union commander over here is a guy named Gugger K. Warren who, as Frank has already told us, had kind of an iffy day, first day of the wilderness. You know, his boss is looking at him, he's not happy, not able to clear things away here, and so his dander is up. And he's going to try to get the other two-thirds of his corps together for an assault against this position. The Confederates continue to fortify, block the road. Warren tries to get the Marylanders together. There's a great sketch of him with their flag trying to rally the Marylanders, and they're all like, heck no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> but he's going to launch a attack across this field that will again be repulsed because Confederates have time to continue to strengthen their defense. Well, now his danger is really up because he's been rebuffed twice. The other thing about this is that we've bottlenecked the Union Army. These attacks have allowed Warren to deploy enough of his men that the next corps comes up, the 6th Corps, under Uncle John Sedgwick. He's the senior man on the field. He should take over. But he sees that Warren is apoplectic with frustration. And a very calm, cool, professional demeanor, he says, you just tell me what you need me to do. I'll support you. I'll help you out. You tell me. And so Warren's going to organize an attack with his reorganized 5th Corps and Sedgwick's 6th Corps against this position. More Confederates making that big circuitous route, blocking the road, following the ridge lines, extending it off in this direction. And so they're able to rebuff in the afternoon another massive federal attack with nearly half the army. And now things are getting a little frustrating. This bottleneck is going to leave Hancock's 2nd Corps back around Keith at Todd's Tavern. And the 9th Corps the ever dependably mediocre Ambrose Burnside. <laughs> he is the paragon of mediocrity. <laughs> he can't even get to the battlefield. He's going to have to march past the bookshelf in the back and come down the side of the battlefield. He's not even going to arrive until the morning of the night. So that's why this blockade becomes so important. And as the Confederates continue to file onto the field and they extend their line, following that ridge line, darkness comes. So they don't really see that that ridge kind of takes a bend in this direction, curves up around our table, and then comes back over here. So we've got a big horseshoe or mule shoe shaped bend in the line. And in the morning of the night, Robert E. Lee, inspecting his line, sees this bend, and he says, this is a terrible position. A salient is inherently weak for a number of reasons. That's what a bulge like this is called, a salient. First of all, if I'm here defending the tables, right? How many of you guys in the front row can shoot at me? Everyone, Everyone. Everyone right? So we have converging fire. You're all concentrating your fire on my position. Whereas my fire is diverging. It fans out. It becomes less effective over distance. So the offensive and defensive weaknesses here are terrible, but also I'm subjected to crossfire. You can shoot your cannons at me here. Maybe you miss these guys, but you hit these guys in the back. Same thing for me guys. So there's another weakness of this position. 
also, if someone breaks through at any spot, you're in the rear of the whole position. So it's really hard to defend a position like this. One of the advantages that this ridgeline does offer is right here in the middle is a piece of high ground called the McCool Farm, several hundred acre farm that has some clear space on it. And Robert Haney is like, well, if the Federals have that, and my line just kind of goes straight across here, the Federals could put some artillery <laughs> on the cars me. It would be a great artillery platform. So that might be a reason to hold this. And he talks to his second in command, Richard Ewell, who's in charge of this section of the line. And Ewell says, I can hold it if you give me enough artillery. So Robert Lee thinks about it, considering the pros and cons. He's a trained engineer, and remember, he is the Harry Truman of this army. The buck stops here. I point that out because we are headed for disaster, and history will excuse Robert E. Lee for it. He says okay, and he will put 30 pieces of artillery here to help you hold the sail. Also on the morning of the 9th, the Federals are looking at their position. You can kind of see through here, they've got a line, a ridge line of their own. It sort of parallels the Confederates. Right here where the 5th and 6th Corps get together, there's an artillery emplacement. There's some 6th Corps artillerists there. And they're getting harassed by the Confederates across the field. So John Sedgwick goes down to see if he can help his guys out. <clears throat> Sedgwick's 50 years old. He's been married to the Army his whole life. Otherwise, he's a bachelor. But he is a soldier's officer. So men, his men love him. They call him Uncle John. He's so beloved. When they're out campaigning, he's the kind of guy who sleeps on the ground under the stars with his men, rather than taking over someone's house as a headquarters. They love the guy, and he loves them. He's personally brave. He doesn't have a lot of razzle-dazzle. He's not some spectacular guy, but he's stalwart. He's dependable. If you want something done, get Sedgwick. Might take him a long time. There'll be no flair to it. So he comes down and he looks after his men. And he starts getting shot at too by the Confederates about 600 yards away. People are ducking at him. Sedgwick starts laughing at the guys. What are you ducking for? 600 yards. I can't hit an elephant at this distance. <laughs> <laughs> one of the artillery says, Why well, duck to one of the big ones for you? It saved my life. And Sedgwick laughs again and says, All right, well, you keep ducking if you think it's going to help you. But I'm telling you, they can't hit an elephant at this distance. I can't hit a major gun. <laughs> no sooner does he stand that second time than he gets hit an inch and a half below the left eye. Spins around, falls over dead, blood fountain from his face. It's a terrible loss to the army. In fact, Grant later on will say the loss of Sedgwick is worth a division. That's 10,000 men. <clears throat> and it's not because the guy was the, the Stonewall Jackson of the Union Army. It's because of the morale blow. So command will devolve to not his second in command, James Ricketts, but his third in command, or third in command of the Corps, a guy named Horatio Wright, who's really Sedgwick's protege. Ricketts knew that if something happened to Sedgwick, Sedgwick wanted Wright to have an opportunity. Ricketts manfully steps aside and lets Wright take it. I'm sure there's also a degree of, I don't want to deal with that crap. You know? <laughs> and so Wright's going to have to take over. It's the largest corps in the Army, about 23,000 guys or so at this point. And, uh, He's going to have to figure out how to become a corps commander and how to employ some new tactics. Because he's going to have some staff members that are going to devise a new type of attack to try to escape this weak cell. While all this is going on, off to the east, Ambrose Burnside finally comes out of the battlefield. His men, the previous night, had in camp in Chancellorsville, marched through that old battlefield. Gives them the willies. They finally get here where they're delayed by four infantry uh, regiments under Cadmus Wilcox. The leading division is going to, um, uh, the Burnside has, is going to be under Orlando Wilcox, who spells his name with two L's, and that second L makes all the difference. And he's going to clear Cadmus out of the way, only enough to allow Burnside to get across a small river called the Nye River, and they create a defensive position on this side of the battlefield. Now, as it happens, this is the most fortuitous part of my whole life, um, my wife's family owns this whole big chunk of battlefield, which nobody has ever preserved, because let's face it, it's Ambrose Burnside. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So my, my, my wife's family has this property. So like I married into my own battlefield. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, earthworks and everything. I tell my wife I love her for more than her earthworks. <laughs> <laughs> but Burnside being way over here is disconnected from the other three quarters of the army. So Grant's going to be very conservative with Burnside over here, feeling that he can't support Burnside being as disconnected as he is. That's going to become important because Burnside will actually have the most success of any federal corps commander at Spotsy, and then won't be able to take advantage of it because of his isolation. So on the 10th of May, Horatio Wright listens to his subordinates. And what they want to do is attack a part of the, the mule shoe right about here. Because they can get within about 300 yards under the cover of the harbor. And that's another reason why it's so important to visit these battlefields, because you can see how the topography influences why the battles unfold the way they do. Uh, and I'll give Frank all the credit here, because he's really the one who taught me how to read a battlefield. And that's why battlefield preservation is so important, because it's a primary source that we need out and see and look. And so that's why they target this spot, because the topography is going to let them look. 300 yards in secret, in silence. The man who was chosen to lead this is a young up-and-coming fella from Batavia, New York, halfway between Rochester and Buffalo, my neck of the woods. And his name is Emery Upton. And he's a young hotshot with no sense of humor at all, very <laughs> earnest, very serious, but also very personally brave. He's looking to make a reputation for himself, so he's always thrown his man into the thickest fight he can find. To his credit, he leads from the front. He's not one of those guys that's like, hey, go take that hill for me. Like he's like, come on, boys, let's go. Okay? He's going to lead 12 regiments, about 6,000 men, and form them not in the traditional line of battle where you're shoulder to shoulder, but instead organize it as a flying column, as a fist. And the idea is to sprint across these 300 yards, punch through the Confederate line, tear open a hole, have some reinforcements flood in, and take this position. In order to support this, Warren is going to attack over here in this direction to tie these Confederates down so they can't shift over as reinforcements. Burnside is supposed to launch an attack along the road against the village to tie these Confederates down so they can't shift as reinforcements. And a second corps division under Gershom Mott is supposed to come from the camera right down and slide into this hole once Upton opens it up. The attack is set for 5 o'clock in the afternoon on May 10th. But Upton's going to take a little longer to get into position than he expected, so he asks for a delay of an hour, which Meade will grant to. But in the meantime, Warren, still smarting over here, sees the chance to do a little showboating. He is superseded by Winfield Scott Hancock, the senior commander on this side of the field. Hancock gets distracted by some um, action down by the river. And so Warren is going to launch his attack early, about 4.30. Not going to go anywhere. Uh, he's going to have a small breakthrough uh, by a guy named Hobart Ward. Nobody was expecting any sort of thing to happen over here, so Ward is unsupported. And he breaks through and finds himself facing the remnants of those Texans that Frank talked about earlier. And he's going to get flushed out of there. And his attack will be over before Upton's even begins. Burnside, meanwhile, doesn't get the memo because it just takes so long to get someone over, so he's going to launch his attack at 5 o'clock, and he's going to do a giant wheel ordered to keep his flank secure on the river and swing this way. And he's going to get to the very edge of spots of the new courthouse, where they'll finally bog down and his men will entrench. And Gershom Mott, likewise, doesn't get the memo. Five o'clock comes, he comes marching right down through here. No attacks going on. The 30 pieces of artillery we need to hold the salients have nothing else to shoot at. Let's shoot at Gershom Mott. Boom. <laughs> and he gets wiped off. Upton doesn't hear any of this because of the location where he's at in the woods. There's an acoustic shadow. You'd think he'd hear all this gunfire. So six o'clock comes. He's going to launch his attack, not realizing he's lost his support on both sides. He's going to push across that field, and as they break through, they're told, or as they start that attack, they're told not to put the percussion caps on their rifles. He doesn't want them to be tempted to stop in the open field and shoot. Get over there, start stabbing. When you have a second, 
you can put your percussion caps off and get your shot off. So as they sprint, and it's a wonderful part of the battlefield to walk because you can see how the topography protects you as you walk up this attack route. And the topography protects them from Confederate artillery. It protects them from the Confederate infantry who only have the time to get off two, perhaps three shots. And Upton's been breakthrough. They peel to the right. They peel to the left. They get that hole. Upton turns to his own reserves, three regiments of Vermonters who aren't there. Because they get so excited, they rushed into the battle already. Where's Gershom Mott? <coughs> no Gershom Mott. This has got to be a moment of desperation for, for poor Upton, who was told that, you know, if you come back, you're going to be a brigadier general. If you're not successful, don't come back. <laughs> now what? Confederate reinforcements start closing in because Warren launched his attack early. And he's able to shift some of these Confederates in to help plug the gap. Lee wants to lead some of those men in himself. So for the second time in a week, we have Confederate infantry saying they're not going in. Lee to the rear, they start crying out. Lee to the rear. And it'll be up to Richard Ewell, who'll have one of his finest days of the war, directing reinforcements to fill this gap and drive Upton's men back across that field. Upton will get his promotion. Because Grant realizes Upton did exactly what he said he would do. It was the rest of the army that failed him. So if Upton can do this with 6,000 guys, Grant starts thinking, we can try it again, but this time we do it with 20,000. Let's use an entire force. And this time, let's have reinforcements ready. Let's say another 20,000 guys ready to fill that gap. And so Grant's going to start to put into motion plans to replicate Upton's attack on a much larger scale and hit the Confederate salient right here on the nose. The hammer he wants to use, pardon me for mixing metaphors, the fist he wants to use is going to be Winfield Scott Hancock's second corps. Remember, Frank told us earlier that this army needed to learn how to fight. And Grant sees that of all these corps commanders, Hancock's the guy who knows how to fight. And so that's why he wants him leading this attack. But Hancock's way over here by the river. So he's going to have to march all the way up and around and get into position. They're going to aim toward a place called the Brown Farm, which roughly a mile in front of the mule shoe. We'll say that Darren is at the Brown Farm today. Darren, how's the farm looking? He's uh, he's good. Very good, very good. <laughs> Won't be too good for too long, let me tell you. Uh, <laughs> So those men will start making their shift late in the day. Meanwhile, Burnside's guys with their big long line of earthworks, <coughs> and dig in. But then he's worried because they're exposed. So he's like, ah, maybe you better pull back across the river. So he's like, ah, okay. Burnside's men start shifting back across the Nine River. And the Grant's like, well, wait, 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 we shouldn't give up all that ground and just blow on up. Go back, go back. And so Grant puts it back. It becomes very frustrating for these men. Because, of course, nobody's telling them what or why to do what they're doing. So morale really suffers in the fifth or the, uh, the ninth corps as a result of all this moving and digging and unexplained movement. In the midst of all this, it starts to rain. It's going to rain for five days, actually. And as Lee is trying to figure out what Grant's next move is, remember, Grant, or Lee's great superpower is to read the mind of his opponent, he cannot figure this one out at all. He's got Birdside over here, and cartographer Jed Hotchkiss does a reconnaissance. He's like, Birdside's kind of exposed over here. And he's like, well, Birdside's smart enough to know not to do that. Well, is he getting ready to pull out? He sees all that movement happening. He's like, oh, I think Birdside's getting ready to pull out. Is Grant pulling out? And they start getting reports of this movement of Hancock's man. And think about these positioned at this moment. They fought in the wilderness for a couple days. They came to a standstill. And Grant moved around the right. We've been here in Spotsylvania for a couple days. We fought to a standstill. And now, <clears throat> is Grant moving around my right? And Lee comes to the conclusion, tragically erroneous, that Grant was trying to move around him again and head to, spots, or to head toward Richmond. So Lee's going to start to mobilize his men. And he's going to pull out his, his artillery because it's the slowest moving part of the army. 
And with this rain, it's turning the roads into muck. So the first pieces of artillery he pulls out are the ones in the mule shoe. Because they're the farthest away from the main roads. He's got just some farm lanes. But he doesn't tell where people. You'll find out because one of his division commanders, a crusty old bugger by the name of Edward Allegheny Johnson, comes to him and says, Where is my artillery? <laughs> and I love Johnson. He's a great character. Um, He'd been uh, wounded in the foot during the Battle of McDowell as part of Jackson's Valley Campaign in the spring of 62. Goes back to Richmond to recover. Somehow, despite his crusty buggerness, uh, develops a reputation as a ladies' man. <laughs> he comes back, we thinks very highly of him as, as a fighting uh, commander. Uh, as, because of his injury, he's got a walking stick made out of hickory. So the men call him Old Clubby. Not very politically correct, I suppose, but he uses that club when someone's not doing their duty. So he waves that around, and he's stalking up and down the lines, and this artillery's pulling out, and he goes to his boss, what's going on? And he goes, like, well, what do you mean, what's going on? And there's some back and forth between Yule and Lee. I mean, at first he doesn't even respond, and then finally he explains to Yule what's going on. And he was like, Johnson's convinced that we're going to be attacked. We're here in... You know, our pickets are giving us the reports and noises and stuff. We think there's going to be an attack. And you will finally convince his lead to bring the artillery back. And he says, by that point, it's too far along. It'll be morning before it gets back. So hold tight. And indeed, something's getting ready. Back here at the Brown Farm, Hancock's got 20,000 guys. Hello, people at home. He's got 20,000 people getting ready to get into a position uh, for that attack. These men are exhausted at this point. They've been marching all afternoon and all evening in the rain. The creeks are swollen. The roads are muddy. Guys talk about it being an exceptionally dark night because of the cloud cover. They say it's the worst night, uh, night march of their entire careers. One of Hancock's subordinates says, will someone at least point me in the right direction so I don't have to march all the way around the world and come at the Confederates from the rear? He's so disoriented. They haven't had the chance to do any scouting. They don't know what they're facing. And so as they finally get arrayed into battle, men are falling asleep on their feet in ranks. Some of them are trying to scratch a note to home using the back of the man in front of them as a board as they write up quick notes. The reports of other men writing their names on slips of paper so that if they fall in battle, they can be identified. It's a desperate, tense evening of exhaustion, <coughs> exhilaration, and terror. And perhaps relief that finally, maybe, they can achieve something. The attack is supposed to start at 4 in the morning. But because of the rain, it's cooled off the hot Virginia spring. And fog has come up out of the bottomlands. It makes it impossible to see through the forest. So Hancock asks for a delay. And finally, at about 425, just enough dawn has broken the sky that his men can see to move forward. And Hancock knows this is desperate. He says, my boys, they will not come back to me. They will not come back to me. They sweep through that forest. And the first thing they do is they hit the Confederate picket line along a farm lane that runs right about through here, leading to the Landrum Farm, off where you're sitting. And it's a sunken farm lane. The Confederate pickets have fortified it. So when the Federals hit it in that dark, foggy rain, they think they're hitting the main Confederate line. And they go, Huzzah! and they scare the bejesums out of the poor uh, pickets who run back into the main Confederate line. And that huzzah echoes across this dark, foggy field and alerts the Confederates who are in the main <coughs> position. About a third of the guys are in line at that point. About a third of them are behind the lines trying to cook up their breakfasts. Their rifles are stacked huddled over their fires against the rain to stay dry and warm. About a third of them are sleeping. But when they get word from those pickets, from that huzzah, the Yankees are coming, they mobilize, and they flood into the works. And the soldiers here fire off at this direction of the approaching uh, Federals. But from where that sunken farm lane is to where the Confederate line is, there's a big swale that cuts across the field. And it cuts across the field diagonally. So from about where you're at, instead of going straight across, it comes right down to about here. So the Federals, after they've dressed their ranks, push forward and they get down into that swale. So the Confederate fire goes over their heads. 
Jim Walker, commander of the Stonewall Brigade, who's kind of right about in here, orders his men to get ready to fire, and when they do, he gives the order. Many of their rifles go pop, 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 instead of bang, because they had their rifles stacked. And the rain had gone down the barrels and left their gun out. Even switching the percussion caps does them no good. So they can't even get a good defensive uh, fire against these Federals as they come across this field. Hancock's got his men divided into that fist we talked about. That fist is going to come in as a big left hook. They're supported by a straight line wave that's going to come straight across. That wave hits as the left hook punches through. And his men are going to peel down the east face of that mule shoot, driving Confederates in complete pell-mell disarray. Uh, one member of the 17th Maine, and this quote's so good, I had to write it down. He says, for a time, every soldier was a fiend. The attack was fierce, the resistance fanatical. It was done in a tempest of iron in lead, in a rain of fire. And as this fighting goes on, there's a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat, but because of the sheer weight of the numbers, the Federals are able to peel open the Confederate line and push into the interior. They're finally stopped over in this direction by James Lane's North Carolinians. These are the men who accidentally killed Stonewall Jackson in the wilderness at Chancellorsville a year earlier. And they've been living under that cloud ever since. <clears throat> they are a hard-fighting, stalwart group of men, as dependable fighters as you can find in this army. And they're already holding off some feeble attacks from Burnside in this direction. And suddenly they're like, whoa, wait, where'd you come from? They have to do this two-front defense, which finally kind of blunts the, uh, the Confederate advance in this direction. Over here, Federals sweep down, knocking out some of the most famous units in the Army of Northern Virginia. Anybody ever heard of Hayes' Louisiana Tigers? Yeah. The poor shattered remnants of Hayes' men are posted in different spots here. They get just swept away. Stonewall Brigade, folks have heard of them? Oh, yeah. Gone. Jim Walker trying to rally his men get shot in the left arm. Men just get swept off the field. The Stonewall Brigade will never exist as a viable fighting force after Spotsylvania Courthouse. And finally, as the assault sweeps in this direction, they're stopped uh, by the men of Clement Evans and Junius Daniels, Georgians, North Carolina. Daniels will be shot through the bowels and will die. But his men will hold. But this attack is so sweeping, so overwhelming. Some 3,000 Confederates are just scooped up and sent to the rear as prisoners. Among those prisoners is old Clubby, who was seen on the works with his club in one hand and a rifle in the other, just beating at the Federals. And the sheer weight of numbers overwhelms him and hauls him off. Also captured is one of his subordinates, George Marilyn Stewart, a brigadier. Stuart, very indignant. Some colonel asked for his sword. He's like, well, y'all have arrived so early this morning, I haven't had time to get it. <laughs> <laughs> Stuart and Johnson both find themselves at Hancock's headquarters, which is going to be back at the Landrum Farm. Hold your hand up so we all know where the Landrum Farm is. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, what's your name for again? Okay, so there we are. And Hancock knew both of these men in the pre-war army. In fact, he and Johnson were really good friends. Uh, they were known for pulling elaborate practical jokes on their buddies together. And Hancock finds Johnson sitting on an ammunition crate with his head in his hands. He's just open, openly weeping at the destruction of his division. And Hancock actually tries to comfort his friend. And Johnson does his claim, his claim. But he says to Hancock, if this had to happen to me, I'm glad it was you if it was anybody. Yeah. Stuart, a little less magnanimous. Uh, <laughs> Hancock puts his hand up and says, Stuart, oh boy, glad to see you. Stuart's like, well, I'm not glad to see you by damn sight. Under the circumstances, sir, I cannot accept your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Hancock jerks his hand back. Says, well, other, under other circumstances, I would have offered it to you. Right? Now, as was customary, if you're an officer and you're taken prisoner, you're given a horse to ride to the rear, and Johnson has afforded that courtesy. Stuart, because he's been a jerk, but he's not. <laughs> he was ordered to walk to the rear with these 3,000 other prisoners. And it's at this moment of crisis, with this gaping chest wound in the heart of his army, that Rowdy Lee comes to the battlefield from the pit. The first person he turns to is his second in command, Richard Yule. 
And Yule's going off like a teapot on the boil, just sputtering, swearing, cussing, calling his men cowards, slapping them with the flat side of his sword, extolling them, get back in the line, as they run past him. And leaves the picture of calm, cool composure. And he looks at Yule and he says, General Yule, how do you propose to control your men if you can't control yourself? He gives him a timeout. You know. Instead, he's going to turn to one of Yule's servants, John Brown Gordon, who Frank had talked about earlier. And if you've never read Gordon's memoirs, they are fantastic. Because to read this account, not only will Gordon then capture the entire Union army, he will sweep to Washington, assassinate Lincoln himself, and then go all the way to Moscow in the winter. That's amazing. <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's a fantastic memoir, really. Uh, last night, when, when Helen was talking, this kind of caught me off guard because she said, One thing I've discovered about veterans is that uh, they tend to get it right and they don't exaggerate. And all I could think of was John Brown. <laughs> 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 Read enough Civil War primary sources. Like, oh, so, uh, but, but his account of this moment is fantastic. And he has seen some of the refugees from this attack already kind of falling back toward the reserve position where he has. Uh, and he's going to send uh, one brigade in to try to kind of just see what's going on. They're going to run into this man. He's going to do some back and forth. Uh, then he's going to turn to John Hoffman's brigade, try to get them ready to go in. And uh, as he's trying to do all this, Lee comes up to him. And one of the soldiers said that Lee didn't say anything. He was silent. He just took off his hat. And he looked so noble and inspiring. But another one of Gordon's subordinates said that Lee had a look of despair about him at this time. And what Lee wants to do is take Gordon's men and lead them in a counterattack to try to stem this flood. <clears throat> and again, Lee's men start crying out, Lee to the rear, Lee to the rear. We won't go forward unless Lee goes to the rear. And I think this is when Lee's ravines got invented, because some poor corporal has to haul Lee's uh, horse to the rear and gives him the death stare. <laughs> but Gordon, he's in full cheerleader mode. I go, I send the end coach. And he says, General Lee, these men are Georgians, these men are Virginians. They never failed you and they won't fail you now, will you, boys? No, no. <laughs> well, Lee gets all off to the rear. Gordon's going to push that attack in. He's going to link up with Lane. He's going to drive up and force the Federals out of the works all the way up to the tip of the mule's ship. Federals don't retreat. They just hunker down on the far side, dig some works of their own. You can see those today when the park has the area mowed. Hard to see when they let the grass grow up. But it's a fantastic, you see just how close they are. From me to the bookseller. And they're just doing pot shots at point blank range all the rest of the day. It's ugly. So then he's going to turn his attention to the west face of the mule show. Stephen Ram George's men, uh, Cullen uh, Battles Alabamans will first go in and try to blunt that attack. And Stephen Ram Jure's men will go in, North Carolinians. Ram Jure will get shot down as he leaves that attack, but his second in command, Brian Grimes, will continue that through. They'll link up with, uh, with Battles men and start sweeping back toward the tip of the mule street, forcing the Federals out of the works. <coughs> it was a perfect field of blue, Grimes said. They continue pushing their way in this direction, and they get kind of in the area where the Stonewall Brigade was, and then Nathaniel Harris's Mississippians come in. They've been working on some earthworks, so a lot of them have camp hatches. Now imagine 800 crazy Mississippians with axes coming right at that. <laughs> Nothing I want to see on the battlefield. They're going to link up and continue to push up in this direction. They won't get quite to the tip of the mule chute. In fact, they're going to have to start going uphill and the Federals are going to have the uphill advantage of be able to fire down into the North Carolinians. And so it just becomes absolutely fierce. It became a matter of bravery and endurance now, one of those North Carolinians said. And so as those Confederate reinforcements are sweeping up this west face of the mule shoe, those 20,000 Federal reinforcements, 23,000 Federal reinforcements under the 6th Corps, shifting into position and coming across the field to try to get into this gap that's still open. But rather than come straight across the field, they get into that ditch, that swale that cuts diagonally right to about this area <laughs> where those North Carolinians are pushing upwards. And so that's why this area here, not the very tip, but this area here becomes the vortex of battle. 
One soldier describes this area as a Golgotha, a place of stones. One describes it as a Saturnalia of blood and a panoply of horror. But mostly we know it as the bloody angle, hell's half acre, where for the next 20 straight hours, men will engage in the most sustained hand-to-hand -hand combat of the entire Civil War, with the rain pouring down, the water up to their knees in these trenches, the mud sucking at their feet, shooting at each other at point-blank <coughs> range, stabbing each other with their bayonets, using their rifles as clubs, throwing them like spears, using rocks, sticks, axes, fists, teeth. Teeth? Teeth. The men were not as men, but as demons, said John Haley of the 17th May. One North Carolina described it as though they had all been through some great bout of sickness and were black in the skin and muddy like hogs. Bodies stacking up three, four, five deep, some of them drowning in the water that had collected in these works. Others getting trampled into the mud, suffocating, because as wounded, they can't pull themselves up. And this goes on for 20 hours. It's a 22-hour fight when you consider the breakthrough and the counterattacks. In the pouring rain, and Lee continues to feed men into this fight so he can buy time to close off the base of the mule shoot. He's going to trade the lives of his men to save the life of his army. Sam McGowan, South Carolinians, those very men who Frank told us earlier had run like a gaggle of geese, get sent into the mix. McGowan, one of the great bullet magnets of the war, gets hit for his fourth time. His second in command, uh, Joe Brown, will, will uh, kind of lead that fight itself. And he keeps feeding guys in so that the remnants of Ewell's shattered second corps can start working under the direction of engineer Martin Luther Smith to create a fallback position. The artillery that was supposed to arrive showed up just as the Federals broke. Carter's battery unlimbers and gets off one shot of canister before it is captured, along with 20 of those other guns. The 10 of them, which don't get captured, get placed in this new line. And so as men work on this, the fighting continues. And the Federals will shift and move, trying to look for any sort of purchase that they can. The bullets flying so thickly that a 22-inch oak tree gets shot down near the vortex of the battle. Now think about that for a second. How much soft lead does it take to cut down 22 inches of oak? And if you don't believe me, you can see the stump of that tree in the museum in Washington at the Natural, uh, National History Museum, American History Museum. It is a powerful artifact that tells the story of this battle. One of the North Carolinians, as he was advancing across the McCool farm into the fire, <clears throat> had bullets zinging over his head, and they were going through the trees of a cherry uh, orchard that was uh, next to the McCool house. And he talked about the bullets knocking the leaves off the trees, and they fell with that peculiar quiet that snowfall falls on. Even in the midst of something so horrible, he sees something beautiful. Another soldier describes the sound of all these bullets as being like music playing a sad requiem. Finally, by 2 a.m., he's got enough of the defensive position finished that he orders his men to begin falling back. And in twos and threes, they pull out of the fight, making their way back to this last line. Federals realize something's up. They make a last push across the line. They capture a few hundred Confederates and begin a pursuit. But those artillery pieces open fire and discourage that pursuit. And the Federals fall back behind the works of the mule shoe, even as dawn begins to lighten the drizzle in the sky. And the scene of carnage on this field is unprecedented in the experience of these men. One Union officer talks about being able to walk from the Landrum House to this spot without ever touching the ground because of the carpet of blue bodies. Bodies that, in many cases, don't even look like bodies. Consider what those lead bullets did to that tree, 
Imagine what they do to the soft flesh. When an ambulance driver talks about trying to collect the dead from the battlefield, and there, there isn't anything firm enough to hold on to, to lift the body into a litter, they have to roll them in or scoop them up. Bodies look more like sponges than humans, one of them said. This battle isn't even over. We're only one week into the two week engagement spots. There are going to be some 9,000 federal casualties here, some 8,000 Confederate casualties, and we still have a week to go. The rain is going to hamper things as Grant tries to figure out his next move. Geez, he almost had it here. So he, he's not ready to give up yet. So what he wants to do is shift his army over to this position. Burnside has advanced, so he's going to slide the 5th Corps, fifth corps from the far side of the battlefield into Burnside's works. Again, one of the things that makes... My wife's property cool is that we had the Ninth Corps there and then the Fifth Corps. And the Sixth Corps is going to move across. We have three quarters of the army that move across our property at this point, which is fantastic. Sixth Corps is going to move over into this direction. And Grant sees a tall eminence over here known as Myers Hill, occupied by a small family farm. And he's going to launch the Sixth and Fifth Corps against that position. But here's another one of those lessons that Grant has to learn about this army that Frank alluded to earlier. He's used to those smaller, faster, more nimble armies of the West that he had. This is the big, gummy, ugly, slow army of the Potomac. And in particularly in the rain, they're not just going to hop over there and launch that attack. They can't get into position. So in fact, only the 91st Pennsylvania and 140th New York will sweep up in this direction and drive the 9th Virginia Cavalry off that hill. Emory Upton, newly promoted, will also take his Brigade up there and occupy that hill. And Upton gets up there and says, Whoa! <laughs> We're kind of naked up here. And he's going to ask for reinforcements, and he gets two New Jersey residents. <laughs> oh, great. So as they try to occupy that ground, George Gordon Meade himself goes up, trying to see what they have. Even as Jubal Early decides he wants that back, he's not going to be driven off that piece of high ground by some Yankees. And he's going to launch a counterattack. But what's important at this moment is, again, Lee is not figuring things out. His right flank was vulnerable. Had Grant been able to launch that attack, he would have had half of his army perched on Lee's unprotected <clears throat> right flank. And it's only after the stuff with the 9th Virginia Cavalry goes on that Lee's like, oh, that's not good. And he's going to readjust his lines. So this position will eventually become moot. But Early's going to launch that counterattack just out of spite nearly capturing George Gordon Meade. Can you imagine how the war might have turned had that happened? And Meade, again, because he's so calm and cool, um, in a peak of fit, decides to launch a massive counter counterattack to get it back. He would be a little bit overkill. The number of men he sweeps up there, and at that point, Early gets the word from Lee, uh, we don't need that land anyway, and Early's going to begin to pull out even as Meade recaptures the hill. Still raining, armies aren't moving very well. Grant's still looking for some opening. Lee's going to launch a reconnaissance and force off in this direction. And Joseph Kershaw is going to hit the second corps as it starts shifting. There's going to be a skirmish kind of off in your direction between uh, part of Lee's cavalry and United States colored troops. First time we're going to have African American soldiers engaged in combat against Robert E. Lee. They win so convincingly that the cavalry commander, Thomas Rosser, won't write about it in his report. He pretends it doesn't happen. He does not want to admit that he has been beaten by black troops. Because it goes against everything the Confederate Army is built on. Finally, the rain starts to clear. Grant's still looking for an opportunity. He's going to shift thousands, tens of thousands of men back into another assault against this very position on the 18th of May. But again, the slow-moving army doesn't quite get into position. And so as he launches that attack, every bit as big, every bit as, as, big as the attack on the 12th, uh, the guys, as I said, guys aren't getting into position. And these artillery pieces just start opening fire on Grant's advance. They can't even get within a rifle range. 
language because the engineering of this line is so strong. It pins Grant's men in this reserve position where Gordon had been a few days earlier. And they're going to hunker down, and Grant's going to call that off after three hours. Probably the worst part about that attack, though, is as those men came across that field, where so many of their comrades had been buried in shallow graves just days earlier, and the rain had washed those graves up in the heat and started to cook those bodies. We have accounts of soldiers who actually fall out of line because of nausea, because the smell of the battlefield is so sour and rank. There's just one more element to the horror of this story. Half-exposed bodies, in some cases of men's friends, stare at them from beyond the grave in this muddy field. So Grant decides, that's it. You can't get at me. And he's going to make plans to pull out and just go around again. Head south toward the North Anna River, which we'll talk about tomorrow. Except that Lee's not done. He's still looking for an opportunity, and he's going to take his second corps, which is occupying this new section of works, and the big march off in this direction. We're going to head down off on this railway, pass over here, and hit Burnside's uh, supply line that goes to Fredericksburg. This is going to happen on the, the uh, 19th of May. He's going to Sever the supply line. Now, I talked earlier about that war of attrition. How Grant was just going to use up the Confederate armies. And this attack at Harris Farm really illustrates the impact of that attrition. You'll recall the Battle of Chancellorsville just a year and a few days earlier than this. Stonewall Jackson took the Second Corps on a march through the wilderness to attack the flank of the Union Army, the rear of the Union Army, really. He had 28,000 men. Richard Jewell, with that same Second Corps, just a little over a year later, makes that march with 7,000. It's a difference of 21,000 men. Now part of that's reorganization of the Army, et cetera, et cetera. But that's the kind of math that Grant realizes is in play. And if you can just keep wearing those numbers down. These 7,000 men break the supply line. But the other thing coming down that road, Robert Tyler's new division of heavy artillerists who are coming to join the 2nd Corps. These heavy artillery units are massive. Some of them 1,500 men apiece. Brand new green guys to combat. They've been defending Washington and the forts there. And as Grant's been losing men, he's like, I need reinforcements. Come on. So these guys are literally marching down the road as Ewell's men sever that line. And these five regiments of heavy artillerists had this stand-up, knock-down fight with Ewell's grizzled veterans. And because they're new, they only know how to fight the way they've been drilled, and they stand in the open fields against these grizzled Second Corps veterans, the hardest fighters in Lee's whole army. And even some of those men admire the heavy artillerists for their bravery to stand in the open and take it. And some of these regiments have hundreds of casualties as a result. But just the sheer weight of numbers is too much for Ewell's men to handle. And it pins them down, allowing the elements of the 5th and 6th Corps to come up to their support. And only nightfall allows Ewell's uh, bedraggled men to escape. And they'll finally come back into their position. <clears throat> so on the 20th of May, Grant looks around. Any more Confederate shenanigans anywhere? <clears throat> and he'll begin that evening to pull out and head down to the south, uh, to the North End River. We'll talk about that tomorrow. In their wake, there'll be some 30,000 casualties. Some 18,000 federal casualties, a little over 12,000 Confederate casualties as a result of these two weeks of fighting. It's stunning. And let's just add that right to the wilderness, because really this has been constant contact between these two armies. Fighting, maneuvering, mud, misery. And it's not over. We have weeks to go, kids. Weeks to go. So for those of you who've been to Spotsylvania, you know what a beautiful, beautiful place it is. 
when you stand there on a day just like today, and you can listen to the birds and feel the breeze, and the hum of the insects in the summertime, and then it is gorgeous. And you think about the agony that happened there, the bloodshed, and the terror, and the misery. And I find that contrast so compelling. That's why I come and talk to people about it. I am compelled to tell this story of those men who fought and died and suffered there and their families at home <coughs> and those vacant chairs at the table. And they would want you to go and stand there too. They would be glad to have you remember.